CyberHub Engage podcast is sponsored by CyberHub Summit, hosting its second annual cybersecurity summit in Atlanta, Georgia, on October 10th, 2018, featuring a live tabletop exercise with audience participation, global speakers, engaging topics. Experience cyber different at www.cyberhubsummit.com. What you want. Hey everyone, welcome to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. My name is James Azar and I'm your host. And if you're hearing in the background, we just got the news that the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, just died. So we're uh, just going to give a little tribute here for a few seconds and uh, get started on today's episode. Um, giving a little respect to my guest today, Mr. Randall from the Georgia Department of Economic Development. I, I don't want to butcher your last name. Is it Toussaint? <laughs> Did That's I say it, it right? That's it. Dang, I got it good the first time around, it's right? better than I say it, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, welcome. Thank Thanks you. for being here today, man. Thanks for having me. So, Randall is in charge of cybersecurity development for the state of Georgia, which is the number one state for cybersecurity in the country. That's right, right? We are the number one state to do business in the, in the nation. Happy to say that for the fifth year five in a row. Years. Five years running. We're like the Patriots, but a dynasty. In economic development. That's right. That's right. No Tom Brady can take us out in the third quarter. We've got a Tom Brady, and his name's Nathan Deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we won't get into the Falcons-Patriots thing today. Oh, boy. <laughs> it is almost football season, though. I'm a diehard Falcons fan, so I'm ready to rise up. Are you? Yeah. You think they're going – I mean, there's a lot of high hopes around town for the Falcons this year. Can we be the first team to host and play in the Super Bowl? I think it's possible. If any team can do it, it's our Falcons. Yeah, there's a lot of Super Bowl stuff starting to happen around town. You're starting to see more and more of it pop up, huh? Oh, yeah. it's This is a big Atlanta United and Falcons territory. This, uh, I think, is, is kind of a product of our new Ben Stadium coming online. But I feel like we've got stronger defense than we had before. We're shifting gears. We're learning how to you know play through all four quarters uh, <laughs> solidly. So yes. it looks good. Looks good. And Julio's good. Julio's great. Julio's good. I mean, there was that scare a month ago that Julio <laughs> was gonna hold out and not make it to training camp. And he's got the best hands in the league. My yes, opinion. he does. He's he's one of the better under. He's like an underrated receiver in the league. He he is he, but it's like he's now the most well known, best kept secret. So if you're listening, we're talking Falcons <laughs> on a cybersecurity uh, podcast. And the reason we do that is because really, honestly, we're in the state of Georgia. And there's so much here that people don't know about. And being that you represent the state of Georgia, we're hosting, like Mercedes-Benz, since it's been built, has hosted the national championship game. It's hosting the Super Bowl. It's part of the World Cup bit for North America. We're probably going to host a semifinal game here for the World Cup. So, you know, when you're looking for a place to do business cybersecurity-wise, you come to Georgia. That's right. And we're going to talk about why outside of sports and the nightlife and the food scene and all the other things that go on here. Um, so if you're tuning in, I promise you this podcast is not a boring one. <laughs> it is one filled with a lot of different things that the state has done that no other state in the country has done. And if you're in cybersecurity, if you're a CISO for an organization, if you're another state and you want to challenge us, you can you know <laughs> tweet at us. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, CyberHub Engage, um, LinkedIn as well. Um, but we are Georgia-based as a organization, and so uh, we uh, want to represent kind of our hometown uh, and our home state for a little while here. So, because um, we ain't going nowhere. But Randall, hey, we'll get started, man. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing at the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Yeah, I'm a, uh, a senior program manager uh, over at the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Uh, I am one of those rare folks who like knew exactly what he wanted to do when he, he grew up uh, <laughs> at like birth. <laughs> and this is it. Uh, my, my folks were in the military, so we moved around a lot as a kid. And uh, one thing about military bases, it's kind of interesting. No matter where you are, you, you kind of, um, you know, right outside the fence have like this fringe area right outside of town. 
Uh, they usually, you know, stick a couple of tattoo shops there just to let you know um, that it's 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 an area that could be poised for development and growth. Uh, and, and there's kind of some sketchy things that will happen in those areas. And I always had a, an issue with that. You know, I always wondered why that was the case and, and how do you change that? And when we moved back stateside, um, I went to high school in the D.C. metro area. And uh, it was during a time where the city was really going through a, a tough transition. So uh, I just began to get interested in it. You know, we, we would hear about uh, these bills getting passed as like local news, you know, you know, millions and trillions of dollars kind of getting sent different places. And I always wondered, well, you know, this is this is where I'm at. How does how does change happen here? So we started taking a look at, uh, at that when I was in like my senior year of high school and I was really fortunate. I was, uh, working down at the Smithsonian, <laughs> uh, passing out 3d glasses, um, for the, uh, the dinosaur show over at the museum of natural history and happened to just bump into, um, a couple of folks who were teaching at the school called Morehouse college in Atlanta, where they were working on some real cool urban planning things and working on, uh, work, like urban redevelopment and corridor redevelopment and just kind of heard them talking. And, uh, I said, this piqued my interest. So, uh, just went up to them and said, you know, where are you guys from? (laughs) (laughs) And they kind of gave me this weird look and they're like, Atlanta. So that was it. You know, I I was supposed to uh, get into playing soccer, you know, at at some schools out in, uh, in Maryland. And I just asked my dad, I said, Hey, this sounds pretty cool. I don't know much about it, but you know, I Googled it and it looks like it's a real fun place. Can we go down there for a weekend? And I came down to Georgia and have just been in love with the state ever since. Uh, so that's kind of my background. Um, along the way, I've gotten uh, the chance to work you know, out in the D.C. area, too. Uh, I was the Economic Development Corporation for Anne Arundel County's liaison over to Fort Meade. And it's kind of how I got in the cyber mix uh, I've gotten a chance to do economic development over in Savannah, Georgia, and here throughout the metro area uh, in Clayton County and Forsyth County. Uh, so a lot of different different things, but it's always come down to two main things, which is just creating new jobs in a community and then helping to attract new investment to a community. And now, I mean, this is like a dream come true. I get to do this for the state, uh, <laughs> the number one state in America to do business. Uh, so my role is to go out and help attract um, usually like office based and technology oriented companies uh, to move into the area. So that would include things like data centers, uh, call centers, headquarters. But my specialization is in cybersecurity. It's where my, my heart's at. What makes Georgia a great place for cyber? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but why don't you tell us some of the stuff that, you know, you guys are working on that you guys have worked on under, you know, our MVP, which is Governor Deal. That's right. Um, that has really kind of put Georgia in the forefront of cybersecurity and in everyone's minds. Yeah, I mean, aside from this amazing football team that we have, <laughs> uh, I think. Go uh, Niners. <laughs> oh, boy. But we're, we're starting to really, uh, I guess, get known now as an elite cyber hub. I think we, last ranking came out, we're ranked uh, number three in the nation for info security. And it's no secret, we've got about $4.7 billion in annual revenue that are generated from the cybersecurity firms that call Georgia home. And we're home to, you know, over 115 firms, including a few that have uh, actually popped up on the Cyber 500 list. Uh, I think uh, most folks know some of the companies like Pindrop, SecureWorks, Next, Next Defense, uh, IonicSec. Uh, but what's interesting is... Core security. That's right. Uh, We've got uh, a diverse range of uh, folks who are are kind of on the large scale, uh, folks who are in the defense contracting space, and then folks who concentrate primarily with like the fortune levels. Uh, So so I think the diversity also of our our types of companies uh, that are in that space is is pretty unique. Um, When you think about Georgia also, uh, it's it's interesting. 
I think uh, a lot of focus gets placed uh, on spe- specializations. Um, for example, you know, there's kind of the health IT space where most right. folks are thinking about like securing electronic medical records. Then, as I mentioned before, you've got like your Fortune 500 ca- headquarters. Um, and trying to support the business enterprises as they think through how they can grow and make themselves more secure. And then you've got kind of that defense contracting space. And you'll have some communities who are very strong in one of those verticals. What's unique about the state of Georgia is we're becoming stronger in all of them. Uh, I think from the health IT standpoint, um, almost every one of our major medical care provider systems within the state are expanding at this moment. Uh, what's also unique is when you think about the fortune level, I mean, we're home to such fortune 500 brands as Home Depot, Delta Airlines, uh, and when they Equifax, begin, Equifax, Equifax, Equifax yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, hey, I'm just saying like, you know, th- there's also business here. No, you're right. Um, and, and the interesting thing is there's that blend, though. Um, so cybersecurity firms that are in Atlanta are realizing very quickly that they can kind of tap into all those different spaces. There's not exactly one particular vertical. Uh, if you've got engineers who have some talent, uh, you can really find um, some connection points in the, either the public space, the fortune level space, or uh, that defense space. And then um, I think we've been known for quite some time as as, uh, really a financial transaction hub. I think it's 70 percent. 78 percent. Yeah. Of the the world's uh, global payment transactions are processed through Atlanta. Boom. Home transaction alley. (laughs) Yeah. So you you put all that together um, and then you add kind of our talent mix. Uh, I I think we were unique. Uh, I think the diversity of our industry verticals within the cyberspace or the cyber market rather uh, kind of helps us to stand out a bit. I think infrastructure wise too, you know, it's, it's a quietly kept secret that, you know, we've got over 500,000 uh, linear miles of fiber here. And then two of the major fiber trunks in the United States just intersect right in Atlanta. Uh, so we, we've got a lot, we've got a lot to offer. There is a, um, misconception about Atlanta as being kind of a traditional Southern city, uh, state. And when you come here, you know, like I found it fascinating. So when I moved to Atlanta, um, and, and I live in Alpharetta, but for all purposes sake, you know, when I go walk down Pond city market or, you know, Atlantic station, you'll hear German, French, Italian, Korean, in Duluth, like literally like down the street from our house, man, it's like, you know, little Korea. And, um, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of diversity and talent here. I mean, just, it's, it's not what you think when you think of the traditional. So South kind of stereotype, but Atlanta's just, Georgia's just not that it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, we've lately been working with a lot of firms from, uh, the West Coast who are interested in kind of setting up uh, a facility in the Southeast. And that's the first thing that we hear. Um, there, there's kind of a, a preconceived thought that, um, you know, Georgia really is the antebellum South. And we do appreciate, I mean, that's our history. Right. And, that's our heritage. That's we the heritage it. of the region. Right. right. Um, but what's unique is that, you know, we are that and more. Uh, I used to live actually in the community where we're recording this now. And I mean, 20 minutes from where we're sitting at this moment, um, you know, Siemens established uh, an operation center uh, for automation. And then you kind of work your way around and you've got uh, one of the largest concentrations of Asian Americans within the nation in Gwinnett County. Uh, Then Beaufort Highway in that corridor, you've got one of the largest mixes of uh, internationally uh, locally owned businesses, uh, or internationally based locally owned businesses, uh, that stretches from, uh, out where we are here down into the city of Atlanta. And it's, it's amazing, you know, and, and that's not even getting into things, um, like the number of international businesses who have made Atlanta their home. I think that helps to offer up a diverse workforce, And the reason that's special is because as companies begin to think about what they want 
their workforce to experience that's at the top of a list. Well, you want a diverse workforce, right? I mean, one of the challenges in cybersecurity is it's male dominated. It's 90% men for the most part. It's 10% women. The um, notion of minorities in this business is almost obsolete. I mean, we are, uh, I think our state, Mr. Stan Gatewood, who's is the chief information security officer for the state of Georgia, I think he is the only African-American chief information security officer in the country who is African-American. Oh, wow. I wasn't aware of that. But I will say I, I'm really pleased to hear that that's the case here in Georgia. I mean, and also not surprised. Uh, I, I think one of the things that a lot of companies are really appreciating who've moved here within the last several years is that they can find affordable talent, but diverse talent that doesn't necessarily start at the college level. I mean, right. When you look at what our K through 12 systems are doing and what the technical college system of Georgia is doing in terms of getting more students interested in coding who don't fit the traditional mode of, uh, of our information security workforce at the moment uh, from a national standpoint, um, you'll notice that you know kids are coming out of public school with training and coding almost at the level of training in a foreign language. Right. Uh, which is mind blowing. Uh, I don't know if, if I would have been exposed to coding that young, I might not be an economic developer. You never know. <laughs> you, you could be a, you know, like an engineer or a developer somewhere today. That's right. That's right. You know, probably, probably developing like economic development software though. Just probably. To be <laughs> We've developed an app that allows you to economically develop your county. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, it's um, uh, the Atlanta public schools. Um, I can tell you, um, I know this, uh, they're starting an initiative on um, cybersecurity. Um, so for our listeners who, who who are kind of, you know, if you want to get your kids involved in cyber, um, Atlanta Public Schools is starting an initiative that I think is going to roll out either in 2019 or 2020. I'm not sure. I'll know later. I'll know next week because I'm on a call with them on this issue. Um, but they're going to start an initiative um, to also address some of the more, you know, getting more... Um, more children involved in cyber at a very young age. And on the podcast, if you know, you're listening for the first time, we actually had 10 year old Olivia Giesler on the podcast a few weeks ago. She's a uh, girl scout. Her parents are both in cyber. Oh, wow. Um, And uh, she's a 10 year old. We talked about cyber bullying and some of the, some of the stuff that kids go through online. I mean, you and I have kids, um, you know, Micah has kids, but they're still too young to, you know, get online. But, um, um, you, you notice very, and Didi, I didn't leave you out, I promise. I, I, I <laughs> didn't see the ring, so I wasn't going to, you know, leave you out of that one. So, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, she, she gave us some examples and, and I think Mike and I were like shocked, you know, they're playing these little games and their games are getting hacked and people are, you know, stealing the money that they pay in those wow. games. Um, they're getting, you know, chatted up by absolute strangers. And so it's, it's a great initiative what Atlanta Public Schools is doing. And when I read about it, I was like, hey, we got to get involved somehow, some way. Um, because it's the most vulnerable are the people with no resources. Mm-hmm. So you think of the most problematic area. And then that's where you realize that's the most vulnerable area for these predators. It's a scary thought, but it really is the world we live in. So I was in DC a few weeks ago and we met with Congressman Ro Kahana. He represents uh, Santa Clara County, which is, you know, San Jose, San Francisco, blah, 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 blah. And, um, I asked him a question. I said, well, what do you think of, you know, shouldn't we start looking at, you know, reforming our education system to address the new skills that are required? He goes, well, I don't have that problem in my County. Well, of course you don't. Cause everyone who lives in your County works at Google, Facebook, Intel, you know, Apple, you name it that like they're, they're not, you don't have the problems that the rest of America has. Cause you live in a County where people on average make 200 grand a year, right? Kids are in private schools for the most part that address those technical kind of capabilities. So he's got like 10 year olds that develop apps in his County. Like he was telling us stories. I'm like, huh? And I'm, you know, what was key? And I think you and I discussed that at RSA was, well, how do we get the younger generation kind of developed and going quick? Right. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, and that was kind of like one of those where you go, <laughs> well, at least Atlanta public schools is kind of picking it up and going, all right, let's start kind of educating 
our kids on how to become cyber experts from a young age. Let's start at 12, 13, stick it all the way to high school. So when they're at 18, they can start taking their certs and be workforce ready at 20. Because I think the traditional four-year model in cyber does not work. You know, I, I was reading the numbers that came out on um, kind of where the void is like globally right now for cyber. Uh, and I think they were saying it's like somewhere around like 3.5 million, right. um, which is up from, you know, the 2016 numbers or rather, I'm sorry, it'll be 3.5 million by 2021. Right. Um, now you think about that. Like we're at a point in human history where we now know more about math, more about science, more about engineering than we have at any other time in our civilization. And yet, there's a greater demand for these types of services, but we don't have the workforce to address it. So when we start thinking about where that's going to come from, I feel like K through 12 has to be that solution. And you've got to create the pipelines. Well, look at China and Russia, right? So they start educating their kids, I think at the age of eight on coding. By 12, they're master coders. By 16, they're at a level that our college graduates are at. By 20, they're like someone with 20 years experience working at a big company. So technologically, their advancement is greater than ours because they've started investing in their education system early, right? Because they've recognized that, hey, you know what? Gym doesn't necessarily create an economy. It's a healthy lifestyle. I get it. But spending five hours a week on gym means nothing to a student and helping him in his career. Now, I've got to stop you there because I'm a big fan and proponent of gym class. That's what <laughs> afters. I, I, I listen, that's what after school activities are for, though, right? So you got gym, but then you're going to go play football. So now you're going to school, but you're spending four hours of your of your time in physical activity rather than really doing professional development. And my brother in law is an ex football player played in the NFL. And I've shared that with you. Right. Yeah. And so my ex my brother in law, ex NFL player. Right. I didn't mean to call you ex, Joshua. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you guys are not divorcing. If you do, I'll kill you. Um, but um, he played in the NFL, right? He All he did was gym, right? All he did, he, I mean, he didn't have an education outside of that because his sole focus was athletics, right? So at the age of 40-something now, he has to reinvent himself because his football career is over. And really, his only career path is to stay in football in some capacity, Right? So how many of our athlete students are we limiting by spending five hours a week on gym rather than teaching them business class? So if you're going to be a star athlete, how many – for every LeBron James, there's a thousand others who have failed in managing their finances that have not had a LeBron James type of you know sturdy reputation and career, right? So yeah, Speaking of LeBron, I mean, I've been interested in, in uh, kind of his approach that he's taken with you know, creating a school. Uh-huh you know, that allows for the students who previously didn't have access to that type of training um, to tap into it in like and one it's all centralized technology. location. Right. Yeah. And it's all technology. It's all but the future. There's right. a trend that's starting to happen a little bit in, in Georgia where, um, and, and it's, it's locally driven, but it's supported on the state level. Uh, but a lot of our middle and high schools are recognizing that if they start funneling uh, students who have an interest in a particular uh, area, um, they can kind of guide them towards a career pathway. So now that opens up the doorway for you know businesses to get more engaged and for these collaborations to happen. And you're starting to see these unique types of, uh, of, of programming emerge, um, kind of going back to the group that's near us with Siemens, you know, mm -hmm. an example of that, I think they're in Forsyth County, but with Forsyth, um, they realized that, you know, Siemens had a need to really like grow their workforce, but they needed to start a lot younger in almost middle school. Uh, and then Forsyth recognized that, you know, although, you know, they are a technology hub. There are rural parts of the county uh, where students might not necessarily go to a four-year college, but those kids who've worked on a farm for part of their life really have developed technical engineering skills without knowing that that's what that was. Right. So they created this unique program where Siemens actually went into the high school 
built out a full scale model of their laboratory and they started training kids right there in high school on how to do what's done with in their actual facility, but in high school. And then they started focusing on redeveloping the curriculum around it. So now you've got a career pathway based curriculum where if somebody graduates in 12th grade, they've got a year's worth of training and can actually go into a facility with knowledge that, you know, a person who didn't have the ability to tap into it wouldn't have. So they're ahead of the game career wise. And we're starting to see that same type of approach happen with coding. Um, I, I think the curriculums, you know, are starting to be formatted. Uh, but w- what's been really interesting, too, is seeing how our technical college systems have responded to that need. I think it was uh, about five, six years ago, um, you know, Governor Deal went out and just asked everyone uh, to kind of talk about what the needs are from in the business community that they were seeing. And, you know, computer science was, was definitely one of those. And they created this list of high demand career initiatives And from that list, uh, they develop programming within our technical colleges. And now, I think it was last year, they they announced the HOPE Careers Grant. Right. And they said, if you are interested in pursuing one of these HOPE Careers, uh, or rather interested in pursuing one of these high-demand career initiatives, Georgia will cover the cost of this for you. Right. Um, So now we're starting to see, you know, high schoolers, leave that last year uh, in 12th grade and go right into the technical college system uh, and even do that sometimes with dual enrollment and and start tapping into um, kind of the next phase of their their cyber ed- education, which is very unique. You know, they don't incur the cost for it, and then it creates a talent pipeline for, for the companies. Speaking of cyber education, so we've got Georgia Tech, probably one of the top universities in the country, right? Um, we have the... Uh, um, University in Columbus. I forgot its name, so you're going to have to forgive me here. Columbus State. Columbus State. So I'm sorry about that. We have Georgia State that has an InfoSec program, right? UGA is starting their InfoSec pro- program. Kennesaw State has an InfoSec program. Mercer? So Mercer has an InfoSec program. And now we've got Augusta. That's right. A multi million dollar facility that. Our Tom Brady, Governor Deal. I'm going to keep calling him that now because <laughs> of you. It's going to be horrible, man. Um, Mackenzie's going to call me and rip me into shreds. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, um, tell us about the Augusta facility, that um, the Nathan Deal Cyber Center. Is that what it's? Yeah, so we've called? got the, the Nation Deal, or I'm sorry, the Nathan Deal Innovation Campus, okay. uh, which is a campus located in Augusta University, right on the riverfront, uh, that features the uh, Hull McKnight Georgia Cyber Center. And that facility is really the pinnacle demonstration of collaboration at its finest. Uh, it's It really came about because of a few things that are happening uh, in Georgia right now. I think when you, you look at kind of the defense side, you know, Fort Gordon has always been a major hub for us uh, within the state. Uh, but what's unique is that um, within the next uh, three to five years, they've got about 4,700 more personnel that are scheduled to, uh, to, to be onboarded at the post uh, who will focus more on military intelligence uh, and then also on cybersecurity. NSA is also uh, a station uh, over at, at Fort Gordon, uh, and I believe they've got uh, a 600,000 cryptologic or square foot cri- cryptologic center on the, on the site. Uh, so a lot's been happening there, but uh, what's been unique is that we've recently had Army Cyber Command uh, repositioned from Fort Meade uh, over to Fort Gordon here in Georgia. Um, Army Cyber itself is looking to create a 324,000 square foot facility uh, that will be about a, a $189 million investment um, on the first phase, and that's currently under construction. Uh, that's going to be completed, uh, or phase two, the full facility will be completed by about 2021. Uh, and the reason I mention that is as we begin to take a look at how the nation responds to cyber threats 
Fort Gordon now will play more of a central role in that uh, with the command being uh, positioned here within the state. So in order to support uh, what's taking place on the post, our governor uh, committed about $100 million towards the development of a cyber innovation campus that would allow for both the public sector, the private sector, and the defense uh, sector to collaborate on first developing talent, uh, training talent, and then responding to cyber threats. So essentially it's an innovation hub. Uh, within the, f the building itself, uh, there are secure office spaces as well as collaborative spaces. Augusta University uh, has quite a bit of, uh, of training space on campus. So you'll be able to access their curriculums there uh, within the cyber uh, training fields, and then Augusta Technical College also has uh, um, space within the facility too. Uh, we were informed recently that the, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's forensic team uh, will now be based out of that, that facility. And then just adjacent to it, uh, we're working with uh, several companies who are interested in expanding their footprint uh, into Georgia, and they're considering that as a location. What's unique is it's also located within a less developed census tract, which means that the state of Georgia is able to offer a series of incentives that support companies who are creating new jobs there. Is it, is it strictly InfoSec job or is it, um, a let's say, a Fortune 2000 company and I'm looking to expand my InfoSec talent, so can I set up in that center or is it? Because, you know, you kind of said, you know, private, public, and defense. Yeah. But uh, a lot of our CISOs are commercial CISOs. A lot of our listeners are commercial listeners, right? And so I think the question that really, and the question on their mind uh, representing the listeners is, if I'm, you know, and I'm going to throw company X under the bus here, um, and I'm looking to hire 20 more people, but guess what? I'm based in Y, and Y doesn't have a lot of talent. So can I base my InfoSec team out of Augusta? I mean, is that a possibility? Is that... Is that part of the purpose of that building? It is. It's it's a warm landing site for all of the above. Uh, for larger companies who are seeking to explore the ability to navigate contracts with Fort Gordon, we found that they have a particular interest in uh, kind of scaling a team, if you will, uh, using that facility. And then for firms who are on the private side who uh, you know might not necessarily have a particular interest in uh, defense contracting but do recognize that there's some tremendous opportunities in Georgia and are really trying to tap into the talent that's moving through that building on a daily basis they're finding it also to be a warm location now here's the key about all of this. Oh, there's a key. There's a key. There's always a key. There's a key. All right. This, if this is a short. Everyone is in the building at the same time and challenges are presented and you've got talent that's working at these different levels and also coming from different sectors. Everyone can collaborate around the problem. And that's when innovation happens. That's where you overcome a problem in maybe two days rather than 17. That's it. The city of Atlanta. Um, just saying, just saying more, you know, more collaboration, collaboration, solve a good. problem faster. It is. it is. And it's not just happening at that site either. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that that approach is also something that's unique throughout the university system of Georgia. Uh, Georgia tech, uh, I think is another great example to bring up. They, in Tech Square, have created uh, an innovation center-based approach where private sector companies can come in, set up small hubs, and be able to tap into the talent that Georgia Tech has, and then use that kind of a collaboration to address challenges that they're finding in the private sector. Is there state-to-state -state cooperation on your level on the economic side, uh, when it comes to the Augusta Cyber Center, I mean, Columbus has a huge cyber range. Um, Atlanta has all the, you know, kind of cybersecurity companies development, plus a lot of the fortune, you know, 1000 companies that are based here. Um, is it, you know, you almost feel like states are competing, but you know, that kind of looks like it because every state makes a different announcement. But <laughs> is there collaboration? Is there real talk between states on, you know, I mean, Augusta's across the river, South Carolina. I mean, you literally can throw a rock into South Carolina from the cyber center in Augusta. That's right. 
I mean, is there collaboration between Georgia, South Carolina on this um, uh, there and is. other states? Um, I, I think um, what's unique is that cyber uh, is one of those. Well, there's two things. First, no matter who you are, no matter what side of the political aisle you are, everyone values the opportunity to create jobs and capital investment within communities. So Correct. economic devel- development is always kind of the thread that goes between multiple jurisdictional fabrics. Everybody gets it. Uh, the other thing that's unique is that uh, cyber, from a national standpoint, is, is um, becoming something that's on the forefront. And it, it, things are changing so quickly that we're having to recognize that, you know, every state doesn't have all the answers. So from Georgia's standpoint, it's been pretty unique. Um, after the Army Cyber Command announcement uh, was rolled out, uh, the team in Georgia actually went to Maryland uh, and sat down with the garrison commander at Fort Meade, uh, and then also with some of the regional partners and then even with folks from the Maryland Department of Commerce and just ask questions uh, about like how, how do you navigate this? You know, what things have you all learned with having a command within your state? What can we do as a state and what can the regions within our state do to support the command as it rolls out? And through those kinds of discussions, we've created these new partnerships uh, that are less competitive and more collaborative. Um, and what we're also seeing is it's translated into business development. Um, companies who may have a larger footprint uh, in one jurisdiction, uh, but are, have an interest in Georgia are able to, um, through these collaborations and these, these pathways that we've created, um, kind of walk across the line and then learn a little bit about what we're doing uh, and then set up smaller footprints here that will eventually grow and scale accordingly. You kind of brought up earlier when we were talking about the college system and so many other ones, um, the Georgia ecosystem. Given that a lot of our listeners are in the cybersecurity field, either in the leadership role or somewhere there, um, what highlights the Georgia as a state cyber ecosystem? Because, you know, Fort Meade is just one part, right? So when you look at other parts, and no disrespect to Fort Meade, you know, they do a lot of great work, or San Antonio is just one part. But the state of Georgia is really a cyber state. I mean, from side to side, north to south, you know, east to west, there is something happening on every side of the border that is cyber related. What kind of ecosystem do we have here that the state really, you know, recognizes its potential that is, is appealing to the private market? Well, I got to tell you, James, um, I am an award winning <laughs> chili competition connoisseur. So in my award winning chili, just got to mention that one more time. <laughs> I'm undefeated at the moment, too. Uh, not cocky. Just just throwing Confident. it out there. That's right. That's right. Tom Brady style. Um, <laughs> it's Brady, man. <laughs> but um, one thing with chili, it, it's it it it's comes down to a blend of things. You can't be too heavy on one side in terms of you know your meat or your protein products. You can't put too many vegetables. You have a really beany chili. Some people will like it, but everybody won't. But if you're able to really come up with a good blend, you've got a perfect chili. So. That requires a lot of time and attention, but a lot of balancing of ingredients. I think with our cyber ecosystem, we've created something that's very similar to my award-winning chili. <laughs> um, when you and you brought it up in a really great way, you know, um, when you look throughout the state, especially when you kind of bounce off the borders, uh, we've got resources and academic institutions that are really cranking out the next wave of talent. Um, one thing that's also unique is that uh, we are home to eight um, Center of Academic Excellence designated institutions uh, who've been recognized by both NSA and the Department of Homeland Security uh, in terms of either their research uh, or the curriculums. Uh, So just kind of going through that list, you've got Augusta University, Columbus State, of course, Georgia Tech, I mentioned earlier, but Georgia Southern's in there. Uh, Kennesaw State University, Middle Georgia State University, 
of course, UGA Go Dogs, uh, and then University of North Georgia, uh, which is um, really thriving uh, up in Dahlonega. So when you, you start thinking about the positioning of those institutions and the fact that you know, you've know you got curriculums that are emerging and producing this level of talent, it is a great blend. Uh, what, what, but one thing we've recognized very quickly is that um, as our veterans are coming uh off of active duty, we're having to make sure that they're aware of the resources that are available to them. Uh, and because we have an abundance of, of military posts here within the state, um, as you might imagine, um, there was a need to create kind of this central, not repository, but this resource point. So uh, in, in um I guess about four years ago, uh, the governor uh, helped launch the Vector program, which was designed to make sure that veterans who wanted access into private sector jobs, uh, as well as their spouses, uh, could find some easily manageable connecting points into, um, into those positions. Um, and in the center essentially helps to translate uh, you know, their KSAs into resume-oriented uh, language. So that way, as they're walking into an interview, they're able to demonstrate what their capabilities are. But that in itself adds to our workforce. Um, and it helps to deploy folks around to those different areas where cyber is growing. Um, so you're right. We, we've got a great blend. Uh, I think the talent, um, the private sector companies, and then the growth that's happening in the academic institutions all kind of add up to award winning Chile. Well, there's a lot of different innovation centers, too, in, in the downtown midtown area um, that are just, you know, places where startups come and just absolutely excel. I mean, I think every single major company you know, that you mentioned earlier that's based out of here started in one of the innovation centers. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, ATDC or, or, or Tech Square or, you know, uh, Atlanta Tech Village, and, and th they grow from there. I mean, they essentially just blow <laughs> up from that point. I was, uh, I was in a session where uh, Paul, one of the founders of... Um, Pin Drop. Yeah. Paul Judge. Paul Judge Great was guy. mentioning... I say Paul like we hang out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Paul Judge uh, had been asked a question, you know, by a group from California who was considering looking at our area. And he, they asked, you know, what, what kind of made you want to come to Georgia? And he, he brought that up. He said, you know... Um, people don't think about innovation in terms of talent. They think about it in terms of products. And he said, uh, one of the things that really worked for us was that we were able to go right to a lab on Georgia Tech's campus and come up with our product using the talent there. But what happened after that was that if we had five or six other major questions that needed to be answered, the kids were so well-trained that we could just throw any challenge at them. And then that's what led to them being able to collaborate and work through their innovation center and kind of grow into what we know as pin drop. And hearing him just kind of outline that, I mean, it really speaks to it. Uh, these centers create great connection points, but even more so, it, it, it creates the opportunity for people to think through whatever challenge might be in front of them. And I think that's what George is really good at. Finally, we were at RSA together this year. <laughs> uh, the state of Georgia. I've spared, got pictures, man. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the state of Georgia and the Metro Atlanta Chamber spared <laughs> no expense at having a really nice boat in Pier 39 in the San Francisco Bay, which. Uh, thank you, Metro Atlanta Chamber. Thank you, Metro Atlanta Chamber. Jorge, we appreciate it. Grant, again next Mr. year. Wayne maybe Scott, a, yeah. Maybe a bigger boat boat next year though <laughs> and i felt like you were getting a little claustrophobic in it at one point <laughs> there were so many people you could only have like 20 people on the boat it was a good time though we were right uh in the bay i mean we were overlooking alcatraz wasn't it yeah yeah and you know and the sea lions the sea lions and oh and you know georgia bourbon we had all georgia liquor was that there yeah, we had all Georgia oh, liquor. Man. I was drinking a Georgia made Coca Cola. I couldn't quite win them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you kind of learn from RSA that kind of opened, changed your view of of how we present Georgia kind of nationally? 
You know, RSA is a huge animal to take in. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's a large conference. And um, one thing that was really surprising to me was the fact that people knew about Georgia um, already. We went there to kind of make a splash and to do a little bit of recon and, and learn the lay of the land. But in setting up our booth, um, I mean, before we even opened it, people were walking by and asking us about Army, uh, Army Cyber Command moving. Uh, folks uh, already knew about some of the major companies that are emerging from Georgia. So it was great to see that, um, you know, we're, we're making a splash and we're, we're kind of getting our name out there. The, the other thing, though, uh, that was a big surprise was um, I think the fact that we didn't see as many states there. Um, I think there were more countries represented, right. right? We had the Israel pavilion, which was like two pavilions. It was, it was insane. Two stories too. We had like, amazing, uh, lanyards for the name badges too. Yeah, I did. I have, I have one in my office. That was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> they had ama- You had Germany. That's right. They were giving out pretzels and beer. They were. Like, that's right. I yeah. missed the pretzels and the beer though. Right? Um, that's in my fat days. I'm down to like <laughs> 20, like 15 pounds now. Is that what I'm down? Michael, what? I don't know. Yeah, I'm down. Like, you look at me, boy. Nice. My stomach's almost gone. I'm going to be six packing it by the time we go to RSA in February. I feel like we traded stomachs then. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Germany had th- uh, stuff there. Um, I think the UK had a pavilion. Yep. Yep. Ireland had a pavilion, if I'm not mistaken. China. China didn't have a pavilion, but uh, way we was there, no right. one was at the booth. Yep. Um, we have pictures to prove that we literally <laughs> like would walk by there every hour. It'd just be like two Chinese people just standing at the booth going like, eh, no one's talking to us. Yeah, pretty much government proxy. You're not going to get a lot of attention. I mean, compared to them, we had a relatively small booth. Um, but yeah, they had pavilions. They, I mean, they were representing yeah. a lot of different. I mean, when you look at Georgia RSA, though, I mean, One Trust had a booth, Pen Drop. I mean, all those companies oh, yeah. had. I mean, if we would have done a a, a uh, Georgia pavilion, it would have been an entire row. Well, funny you mentioned that. Next year, that's our plan. Uh, I, I think we recognize that there was a strong opportunity to start doing just what we talk about, um, but in how we go about presenting ourselves, and that's collaboration. So we're getting a larger pavilion. Uh, we're kind of centrally located near Pindrop, uh, but also near uh, NSA uh, in terms of like our, our placement. But we're bringing companies with us. I think this year we went to kind of learn a little bit. We co-hosted an event with uh, some of the, the teams from Maryland, uh, which went really well. Uh, our CTO gave a couple of presentations uh, for the state. But I, I think next year we would love to have uh, Georgia companies in our pavilion and, and kind of share and tell in that story. And then I think uh, we would love to explore uh, even offsite events. Um, I think the Metro Atlanta Chamber's idea of, of really pulling everybody over to have these informal discussions, you know, in, in a really intimate space was, was great. And I think that's something we can build on. Indeed. It's uh it was a it was a lot of good time. I know you guys are looking at us. We're reminiscing. We're, <laughs> you know. Did you do the in and out run with us? Oh my gosh. Did yeah. you you did the in and out run with us, didn't you? But you know what? Um I really We did that like every night. I really got some good ideas for my chili from In and Out Burger. Just throwing it out there. Just throwing it out there. I mean, we did an in and out run every night. <laughs> It was it's crazy. good stuff. That was actually my first time uh, grabbing an in and out Like we're in San Francisco and we're getting in and out instead of clams and oysters and like fancy food. We're just like, oh, we're going in and out. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody was there. That was the fun thing about yeah, it. Yeah. Like you'd go to in and out it'd be people with RSA badges. You're like, hey, <laughs> what do you do? Well, you know, that's what I do. It was like, it was like the place to network during RSA is in and out Burger. Oh, yeah. Pretty much. Like, don't go anywhere else because everyone who's not from California who is there is going in and out at least twice or three times. We went last year with um, the team from Columbus State University. They had just opened the uh, TSIS Cyber Training Center down in Columbus. Uh, And then we also went with uh, our partners from the Augusta area. 
uh, and a few other communities, and it was very community focused. And right. I think we'll keep that up, um, but we'll add more businesses to the mix, and I think we'll probably like schedule these in and out runs this time. So that way we've got like like some designated moments where in and out just appears, you know what I mean? We I, I think we should do like we should like lock down an in and out for like four hours. <laughs> and host an event. And host an event at In and Out. I think no one's done that. You know, if So we, we would it would great break or a Chick fil A. <laughs> I'm I just saying Chick-fil-A is local. I love that idea. Actually. And I'm pretty sure that like Chick-fil-A will comp us the food. Actually writing that down. Hey, Chick-fil-A. I'm volu- laughing because I'm writing this down. I'm, I'm, vo- I'm, vo- I'm volunteering Chick-fil-A <laughs> to give us food for free at RSA. You know, we, uh, we also learned one other big thing um, from the bio conference recently. We, we went to Georgia Bio in Boston, and um, we decided to switch from using Georgia Peanuts uh, over to using a Georgia-based lip balm that was produced by Savannah Bee Company in Savannah, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And so many people walked up to our booth with that same look, you know? It's like they were really upset. And we're kind of like, is everything okay? And they were like, well, where's the Georgia Peanuts? <laughs> So I think that's something we'll probably work into really the mix like next the year. But I'm I'm seeing this come together from like a food aspect, like Chick Fil A, maybe Coca Cola products. Chick Fil A, Coke, Georgia Peanuts. Valdea oh, Valdea onions. Yep. And blueberries. There we go. And pecans. And peach we cobbler. Pecans at, um, at bio that's right. We did have pecans at Bio. We didn't have pecans them. at. Every time I was hungry, all I had to eat was peanuts. So that's how we're upgrading it. We're going to upgrade it a little next year. Yeah. I was that that was not fun. <laughs> I was hungry and all we had was peanuts. I hated peanuts by the end of RSA. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I literally just idea. started eating Boiled peanuts again. Peanuts. I literally just started eating peanuts again. So when was RSA February? Yeah. Yeah, what are we? August. I didn't eat peanuts for 6 months cuz RSA. <laughs> Because I was like, all like, I'm, I'm eating done. is Georgia peanuts. I'm done. I've had enough peanuts for six months. They work that people want them. People want them. I know, but we should have like Chick-fil-A. Oh, waffle. Fr- that's, that's Yeah, my stuff. six pack will become a keg real fast if I go back to that. That's all right. We can toast your keg with peach milkshakes. It's <laughs> all good. <laughs> Randall, thanks for being on this show, man. I appreciate you coming in. And uh, you're listening to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. Um, we're going to be right back after these messages. But before we do, make sure you follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. What am I forgetting? YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Look up Cyber Hub Engage. Um, thank you for all her list. Thank you for all who are listening. We'll be right back after this brief message. CyberHub Engage podcast is sponsored by CyberHub Summit, hosting its second annual cybersecurity summit in Atlanta, Georgia, on October 10th, 2018, featuring a live tabletop exercise with audience participation, global speakers, engaging topics, experience cyber different at www.cyberhubsummit.com.